Hi, I'm Tom Check, and I've been asked to talk about my favorite experiment. Why did I pick this particular experiment? Well, it was one that I did with my own hands, and there's something special about discovering something uh, through your own work in the lab that as much as I enjoy working with students and postdoctoral fellows uh, and exalt over their discoveries, something special about being able to make a discovery uh, by yourself. This came when we were looking at uh, initially the transcription of a large ribosomal RNA precursor in a single-celled pond animal, Tetrahymena thermophila. The uh, gene that we were looking at made an RNA that was interrupted by a stretch of non-coding sequence called an intron. And at this time, uh, RNA splicing had been discovered a few years earlier, but people knew very little about the mechanism by which an intron-containing RNA would be spliced to rejoin these two flanking sequences called exons and release that intron RNA. Now, we had found in our studies of transcription of this gene that the RNA splicing was taking place outside of the cell, in vitro, with, with our purified extracted RNA. So this seemed to be uh, an opportunity for us to investigate the mechanism of RNA splicing. Initially, this uh, splicing reaction was taking place in the same cocktail of small molecules that were necessary for transcription. So I decided it would be useful to see which of those uh, small molecules was really required, not for the transcription part, but for the RNA splicing. So I added uh, them, I subtracted them one at a time from the transcription cocktail, I added them back, and I found that there were only two small molecules that were required. One was a simple salt, magnesium chloride, and the other was uh, uh, one of the precursors of RNA itself, guanosine triphosphate. A lot of specificity here. G was required. A wouldn't do it. C wouldn't do it. U wouldn't do it. It had to be guanosine. And uh, this seemed unusual. It seemed interesting. Uh, but uh, at, didn't really know what to make of it until someone else in the laboratory, Art Zog, was sequencing the end of the uh, intron after it was excised from the larger RNA. And uh, he found that the sequence of the cutout RNA started with a guanosine residue, which is one of the four nucleotides of RNA. We didn't think much of it until we found out from uh, Joe Gall's laboratory at Yale University that they had sequenced the uh, gene that encodes this RNA and that they were adamant that there was no guanine present near that exon-intron boundary. The rest of our sequences agreed between the two laboratories. And so here we had a situation where it looked like maybe there was a guanine that wasn't encoded by the DNA that was uh, added to the end of the intron. And at the same time, we had this evidence from my earlier work that G was a required ingredient in the splicing reaction. So maybe these two observations were related to each other. Although the idea that one could just add uh, guanosine triphosphate to purified RNA and expect any chemical reaction, any cutting and joining reaction to take place seemed uh, unprecedented and really quite far-fetched. So at the time I did this reaction rather, this experiment rather quietly. I didn't tell any of the graduate students uh, what I was doing. I didn't want to look foolish if this reaction uh, failed as it was probably destined to do. When I uh, added in one tube radio-labeled GTP to uh, the purified precursor RNA, and in other tubes, the other nucleotides, finally, in the midst of my teaching schedule, had an opportunity to run the gel to look at the splicing products, and lo and behold, only in the lane where I had added the radio-labeled GTP was there a radio-labeled RNA band the exact size of the intervening sequence. So I ran back to uh, my office to try to get 
a little bit of peace and quiet to try to draw out what must be happening in terms of a splicing mechanism. And what I quickly came up with was that this guanine that was added during the splicing reaction was being joined to the five prime end of the intron. So it looked like it was attacking the splice site phosphate and forming a new oxygen phosphorus bond that hadn't been there before. Now if that happened, that would explain how the GTP would be covalently bound to the end of the intron, but what would happen with the other product of this reaction? Well, the five prime exon would then have to be released with a hydroxyl group at its three prime end. And exactly the same kind of a chemical uh, step, if it occurred now between this exon and the downstream splice site, would result in ligation of the exons and release of the intron RNA with this diagnostic uh, guanosine at its, at its five prime end. And so uh, I thought, well, has any, is this even chemically reasonable? So fortunately, I had an organic chemistry textbook within reach, pulled it out. It did not discuss this sort of reaction with phosphate esters, but with uh, esters of carbon, this was simply a transesterification reaction. So what was happening, so there was precedent for this sort of reaction. You start out with one ester linkage, in this case a phosphodiester linkage, and you now, uh, using the uh, hydroxyl group of the ribose sugar of guanosine as a nucleophile, uh, attack at this site. Uh, it's a, also called an SN2 reaction, as you've probably studied in your organic chemistry class. And this uh, swapping of partners in this ester linkage turned out to be the key mechanism of RNA splicing. So although it was exciting to have this mechanistic information about RNA splicing, the question of the catalyst that was allowing all of this to happen eluded us for another year. We were assuming that there had to be a protein enzyme that was responsible for a reaction that took place with this incredible specificity. After all, in this long RNA, there was only one site that was being chosen as a splice site. There was also specificity with respect to guanosine relative to the other nucleotides. And the reaction was speeded up many billions of fold uh, faster than a spontaneous uh, phosphotransesterification reaction would be predicted to occur. So uh, if all biological catalysts are protein enzymes, where was the protein? And we uh, spent a lot of time looking for protein contaminants in our pure RNA preparation. Finally, uh, out of uh, a lack of being able to identify any, we switched around the hypothesis and said, maybe it's just the RNA that is folding up to form the catalytic center for this reaction. To test that idea, we were able to make an artificial transcript uh, that had never seen the inside of a tetrahymena cell. And when we added guanosine triphosphate to that artificial RNA, the uh, addition of G to the end of the intron and the RNA splicing that ensued convinced us uh, that it was time to announce that RNA could be an enzyme, that RNA had catalytic activity. Uh, this turned out to uh, be the experiment or the set of experiments that resulted in the Nobel Prize in Chemistry eight years later. But I think it's important to uh, understand that at the time we were not driven by the possibility of getting awards uh, or recognition. It was simple curiosity about how does RNA splicing occur and uh, how could this reaction even be occurring with pure RNA that was driving uh, us in the laboratory and giving us so, so much satisfaction.